Okay, so we made it to mammals, and I've got my, my mammal buddy here to help demonstrate. So let's get right to it with some videos of mammals from my cabin and around the world. In the winter, of course, it's incredibly cold, and although small things like mice and red squirrels don't hibernate, they need to keep warm in nests that they build, but also they need lots of fuel to generate the heat. Makes one wonder how an animal that size could ever survive the winter. There's a huge surface to volume constraint against small animals living in cold environments. Things that live in the north, like polar bears, for instance, are quite large. And that's because you, the larger your mass relative to your surface area, the easier it is to retain the heat that you generate. The next animal I want to talk about at my cabin is the beaver because the beaver has a lot of really cool behaviors, a really important ecological role, as I previously discussed in relation to salmon, and just generally cool morphological traits that suit it very well for its environment. Now, there's certainly plenty of beavers at our cabin. Here is one that I found in a small creek, and I walked up and startled it and set up my uh, GoPro, and it just popped up right by where my GoPro was, so I was able to just sort of chill and observe it uh, for quite some time. Now, beavers tend, as you know, to dam creeks such as this. And so we see a lot of these beaver dams in our area and they're really important in structuring the environment. So this is an old beaver dam here. Now the beaver dam has broken through and so it's not holding back water, but you can see the remnants of the effects it has wrought by killing all of the low-lying trees and originally impounding huge amounts of water. So beavers change nutrient dynamics of the soil, of the streams, they change hydrological flow patterns, they create habitats that weren't there previously, mainly these large impoundments. In larger rivers, beavers will make little lodges underneath the bank without actually damming anything. And so we also see that at our cabin, where there are quite a few beavers that live in the river itself, but don't do any damming. And here's one that we went by while rafting, and we could actually see it underwater. Now, beavers tend to eat the bark of trees. And so, of course, the way they obtain that, as well as the way they get wood to build their dams and their lodges, is to cut them down. This happens a lot, where the beavers cut partway through a cottonwood tree like this and then just leave it and it keeps living. I don't know if they just give up or something else by design. What beavers want to eat is the living growing part of the bark. And so once they cut down the fine tips of trees, they will nibble on them. And here's a video from outside my house in Laval where a beaver is chowing away on um, some small branches that it has stored, as well as getting out and walking around and actually eating vines. They also eat some weirder stuff. One of the nastiest plants in the animal world is devil's club. It has these really sharp spikes with little barbs on them that makes it hard to pull them out. You can have them in your, in your hand for a year after. But look at this. A beaver has actually been chewing off and eating these devil's club. We were joking that uh, this beaver is gonna be really disappointed later. Or that he's playing a trick on one of his neighbors. Try out these fresh greens. Okay, so that's it for beavers. Uh, let's move on to some of the camera trap footage we have. What I'm doing is I'm picking up a bunch of uh, camera traps. They're called game cameras sometimes. 
And what they do is they detect the infrared signals of heat coming off of animals. And so you can put them in remote locations like we are right here, and you can use them as a way of attempting to assess animal behavior, how many animals are present. So if it triggers a motion sensor with heat moving across the sensor, then it's gonna turn on and record for 30 seconds to a minute. Uh, and this one is set up in hopes of seeing how animals navigate an obstacle. So we left the camera in this one position so that we could capture multiple ways in which animals were passing these obstacles, particularly moose. And so I'm recording on the upper left there, where they go underneath on the left, which only the small ones can do, where they go over on the low side or over on the high side, or uh, what amounts to around at the upper end there. And there's a whole series of these videos where they come up and assess the various places and you get the sense that they are actually very concerned with how they're going to deal with this situation. So this is nighttime, you notice. This is 2 a.m. So basically it's pitch black. And so they're having to assess everything uh, with almost no visual information. This one, of course, has too much visual information and is a little bit worried about what it might do, but it's following clearly in the track of one that jumped there previously. So we experience uh, our world, I would say, primarily through hearing and through sight. So we build a three-dimensional structure of orientations of objects and animals and individuals in the world based mainly on our sight. Other animals use other senses. Electric fishes uses electric signals. Uh, fish have a lateral line for sensing water movement. But in addition, many animals like us, like mammals uh, and a number uh, of other animals, rely really heavily on smell. This turns out to be a olfactory signpost for many animals. Why they pick this, I have no idea but we just see it on our camera trap, which is mounted right over there year after year, that almost every animal stops and smells this bush. It's like a place where people leave little post-it notes or uh, like a, a mailbox for everybody who can read the information. So we see bears smelling this, every moose pretty much smells this. We see wolves peeing and smelling and rolling in this area, but we also see uh, other animals, including lynx, so multiple species, multiple individuals over many years are using just this little sprig of uh, conifer right here, a little hemlock. One of the central points of animal life on these trails are bear rubbing trees. It's not 100% clear, at least not to me, why bears rub on these trees, but what they will often do is have particular trees in which they will repeatedly rub on. These then become marking signposts for other bears Maybe a place to scratch an itch, a way to get rid of some uh, fur that you want to shed in the spring. And so you will see bears rubbing up and down in these. It's another really cool example of a bear tree. What usually happens is a, is a bear, and it seems to me that it's often black bear based on the videos we've seen. They take a few bites out of the tree and scratch it a little bit, removing the bark, which then causes the tree to secrete sap all over, uh, all over the bark and then they come and rub on it. So you see on here, there's a whole bunch of bear hair that's stuck on the tree. This was one of the first places that inspired our camera trap work. And if you take a look, there's three trails. So it's a three-way split to the different trails. One might logically think that that trail is gonna go to, I don't know, feeding patch one, and that trail over there is gonna go to feeding patch two, and that one there, but that's not the case. In just another couple hundred meters, they all connect up again. Why would some animals go on one side and other animals on the other when there's no obvious benefit? I think one of the primary things is determining which way animals go, and we suspected all along, was the ease of getting through somewhere. And that differs among the types of animals. For instance, big moose have a hell of a time getting underneath obstacles. Small moose have a hell of a time getting over obstacles. But here is a particularly obvious situation where a moose with antlers will have a big uh, difficulty getting through on the trail. So I've got a great video of a moose turning his antler sideways and putting it through, uh, almost like it's uh, thinking the process through in advance. It's pretty cool. 
And so here we have another split where there's a, a path coming up underneath the tree there, but there's also a side path sort of moving across that uh, other end of the tree there. And we noticed on our camera traps last winter that right in here, you basically had a whole bunch of moose having trouble slipping and tripping, presumably on the ice. Some would also go up there and they wouldn't have nearly as much trouble. And sometimes we see the moose slip and slide over there. And a broken leg on a moose is not going to be a good thing. I've seen a couple of moose with broken legs trying to get around and it's not a pretty thing. But when I was looking on camera traps, I noticed that in fact, there do appear to be a number of moose that have broken their legs that actually get around pretty well. Now it's a bit painful to watch, but you can see that even a moose that's clearly had what amounts to, in this case, a broken ankle, that's the position of the ankle on uh, moose and things like horses and most animals. And then you can see it on a whole series of our camera traps, one after the other, just getting along. Now I wondered if that was moose was around multiple years and so I went back through old camera trap data and I think this is the exact same moose from the previous year. It's smaller but the wound and uh, injury seems almost identical. So I think that that moose made it through the year and I also saw it this year. But it's not just one moose, there's multiple moose that we see with different types of injuries. This is just a goofy video of a moose that's trying to shake off its single remaining antler and it almost falls down in the process. I decided why not see if people on TikTok like this, uh, this camera trap stuff. Turns out they did. So I've been doing a lot of camera trap stuff on TikTok and also on Instagram. Uh, so if you want to keep seeing all this cool stuff uh, from my cabin and elsewhere, you can check it out there. Now to put this guy back, he's... Uh, He'd rather be in with his other six buddies. If there are so many animals on this trail, you might wonder, what do we do for safety, given the number of them are moose, which kill more people than bears every year, and bears, grizzly, and black, and wolves. Of course, we have nothing to fear from wolves. They just simply don't bother humans. But with moose during the rutting season, when they're mating, they can be really amped up on testosterone and basically kill people. Uh, but also bears, of course, if they're startled or they're protecting their cubs, they can be quite dangerous as well. Well, the first thing is that there are actually not that many animals on this trail. It's really only going one way in the fall and the other way in the spring. So we almost never encounter anything on this trail, which is a combination of that and the fact that there are few of them and also the fact that uh, we tend to make a lot of noise if there's more than two people on the trail or they can smell us coming. But we also make noise if we're in areas where we can't see very far. And if all that fails and we do encounter an animal, usually it just runs away. But if it doesn't, we have bear spray that we can use, which is essentially uh, a big pack of pepper spray that's designed for bears that we can use to uh, spray the bear if absolutely necessary. I've never done it myself, but pepper spray is extremely effective at protecting people from bears.